Mari, I thought we'd just have a little conversation about, you know, this whole thing has been about beyond boundaries, technologies that are coming, etc. So before we jump into it, we'll talk a little bit about yourself, what are the things you're excited about, what have things you have learned, and then we'll talk a little bit about technology. We're talking backstage a little bit about, um, you've been in the film industry for how many years now? Oh, uh, close to 20. 20 years, okay. Oh, you haven't aged much, I see. You should ask my bones and my doctor, <laughs> they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the things that we all learn from is our mistakes, from our mistakes. So, in your 20-year career, what are the two or three major lessons for you? And have you learned them, one you learned from our, your success and one you learned from your failure? Um, yes. So, jumping right into it. In today's world, um, from all that I've learned from my travels and my observations, People keep asking me, what is the sure shot way of knowing that, forget about success, that you're heading towards failure, okay? And what I'm going to tell you is something that the film industry often suffers from. And my, my idea is this, when you have a success in today's world and you try to repeat it again in the same way possible and you become successful again, and you try and do it again the third time, which is taking the easy way out, thinking that very formula will give you success, that has become your first step towards failure. Because the moment you think that it is not imperative to change, the moment you think that you've come to a situation where your crew is controlling everything, and you can repeat the same formula over and over again, you can be rest assured that you started this rather steep decline in every step that you're going to take henceforth. The same thing happened with the film industry. The moment one story and an actor or a film becomes a hit, 17 people yeah. come to capitalize on the exact same idea. Yes, Let's it's a do, me too. Me too kind of a film. Yeah, yeah, me too. And then the point is they don't realize, and as it is true with life, is that there is absolutely no formula that will work again and again and again for you. Especially when it comes to telling stories. Especially when it comes to art. And especially when it comes to technology, which right now depends as much on art as art depends on technology. And I will explain that later on when we speak. Sure. One of the things I learned with my failure is that it provided me with a lot more data on how to build on the success or how to build on my attempt on the next level, as opposed to the success which had, an, uh, had a way of getting you addicted to the fact that you were uh, in band quenchable, that you could yeah. be, uh, you know, n no, nobody in the world is bigger than you. So I've, uh, that was one thing that uh, failure taught me. Uh, one thing that success taught me was that if you dwell too much on it, if you bask in the glory of it too much, which I used to, I have made all these mistakes, these are my life lessons. If you bask in the glory of that success too much, it has a way of encompassing you and making you and putting you into a bubble which then the outside world cannot penetrate. Yeah. And that is a big danger for anybody who's uh, successful. So as a as a rule, whenever my film releases, irrespective of whether it's a hit or a flop, I distance myself from the outcome by going abroad and not hearing about uh, what it is. I just make one phone call and my manager tells me, yes, or uh, enjoy your holiday longer. One of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me about um, a, a lesson, a big life lesson you learned from failure about yourself, you know, what sort of movies you should do or whatever. Give me some example of, a specific example. Strangely, it was success that taught me that. Okay. Um, there was a phase in my life after I'd finished about seven, eight years of films. Whatever I did was doing fairly well. I was able to, you know, uh, attain a certain level of success. More importantly, I had uh, begun to take myself and the success for granted. So I'd become complacent. Uh, I would eat and uh, party and drink and put on weight not care about it because irrespective of what I did, it was working. Yeah. But that was a, it was smart for me to realize that that was my first big step towards failure. My wife, uh, you know, who was very perceptive about how I am, on the way to a shoot one morning, she looks at me and says, you know, earlier on, you used to be nervous, excited, you used to bound out of the house with a, you know, with a uh, excitement of a young puppy when you went to the shoot. But you know, Maddie, you're just kind of like sauntering out right now. Everything okay? And I said, oh my God. If she's able to feel it, then there must be something terribly wrong. So what I did, ma'am, was I decided to put myself in the open. So I stopped taking films. I stopped taking endorsements. 
I I wanted to take a conscious effort to beat my ego to pulp. So I actually did that. I I mean I put myself through shame in the sense that I started you know my 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 finances started dwindling. I came down to my last fifteen lakhs, but I took a break for four and a half years to just find out. Which is the world that I'm making this movie for? Who is these audiences that are evolving over a period of time, and how am I going to entertain this technologically advanced, more aware, extremely smartphone-oriented generation? What sort of movies should I make to be an aspirational factor for them? So those four years of beating myself, actually going by rickshaws to producers' offices just to know how it feels and talk to the rickshaw guy to know. Uh, that he has a smartphone and he watches my Alai Payude or my first film songs uh, on on his rickshaw, and I'm at his beck and call as an actor, which was not hap- which was not true 20 years ago. Yeah. If you had to see an actor, you had to wait for the film to release. At yeah. best, a TV interview. Now, my entire biography with my family, my dog, my art, uh, my uh, you know interior decoration, as well as all the songs that I've done, yeah. are at his beck and call. Yeah. And if I'm going to dwell out of that. Then I'm sure shot working towards failure. So, so when you came out of that four years, what's the first movie you did? Uh, my first film was uh, a Tamil and uh, Hindi film. In Hindi, it was called Sala Khadus, and in Tamil, yes. it was called Eridhi Sutra. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's one of the best movies of yours I've seen. I think. Thank you. It is a very completely different persona. Yes. Than what you have played till then. I mean, to the extent that, pe- like, I couldn't even recognize you in that character. Yeah, while I was growing my beard and hair. Nobody recognized me in the airport. Nowhere. I was actually just. Uh, um, I really felt my market was done. <laughs> but, but thankfully, I had to shock them with that look. I had to shock them, and people should should turn around. And so the the whole key here is the word called aspirational. Yeah. It's a word that is going to be determining the market, uh, be it uh, technology or the film in the near future. So. The, everybody now goes to the gym. I mean, there's hardly anybody here who I can say is overweight or, or, or obese. Everybody knows about makeup. Everybody is smarter than most of my uh, writers who are writing my story. So, what was it about my films that would compel the audience not to watch it on their smartphones, but actually head on a Friday morning with their entire family, spend four thousand rupees to see this particular movie only in the theaters? What was the bahubali factor about my film? Is yeah. what I had to work on, and that's yeah. why the entire appearance. Um, you also talked about uh, a movie that you were in, which didn't work out the way you wanted. Yes. And there is an interesting, uh, you know, phrase you came out for the people who asked you to do the movie. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So when I first started my career in Tamil, uh, my first film Alai Padi had become a big hit, and had as did the next film I did called Minnale. And then I had no advisors. In the film industry, because I was breaking ground, I was one of those guys people thought would never make it as a Tamil actor, simply because a very interesting story. Um, during the release of my first film, I was coming out as a romantic film. It was a romantic uh, film with Shalini, and uh, the PR department, when they came to brief us, said, "Whatever you do, Madhavan, don't tell them that you got married four months ago." Yeah. <laughs> so I said, "Why?" They said, "No, no, no married actor has ever made it in the film industry as a romantic hero. The girls will take an aversion for you. It is not going to work out." And I am not very comfortable with a lie, and especially about a woman who is part of my life, and to ignore her and to to tell the audiences that she's not my wife was not something that I was going to do at all. So I went and told Mani Ratnam. I said, Mani sir, this is what they are saying. Do you want me to comply? And he said, You do whatever you want. I said, Okay. So the and sure enough, the first question that they asked me uh, in that uh, publicity meet was, uh, we, we believe you got married four months ago. What do you have to say? Who's your wife? So I told the media then. I said I'm very sorry uh, that I'm going against the wishes of my PR department, but I'm married. My wife's name is Sarita. Uh, we, we we were going around for nine years, and we got married, and this is it. I was told that the Tamil audiences will not accept me if I uh, told them that I was a married uh, actor. But you know, I'm an actor. I cannot uh, undermine or insult my wife. At the same time, I want the Tamil audiences to like my movies. So uh, in 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 all humility, I am married, and I hope that they. They accept me for who I am, and more than the film, that line became so popular that I became instantly popular uh, with the ladies when the first film started. So now everybody thought, okay, this guy has changed the rules over there. So, uh, le- so the people who were coming to me were saying, you cannot be Rajnikanth till um, you do films that work in the B and C center. You know, the villages have to accept you. Only when they go Talaiwa will you become a South superstar. So. 
I, obviously, I was getting all this data which was telling me, do films for the villages, so behave like somebody in the villages and stuff. So I accepted a film where I was playing a guy who was struggling to, uh, you know, feed himself, who was weak, who was uneducated, who was not studying, but who had a dream of becoming a cricketer. So that was the film that I was doing. <laughs> the film flopped so badly that, uh, you know, that the whole uh, studio closed down after that. I think I was uh, instrumental in that. Why happening. did you look like a starving poor guy? No, I was just coming to that. So because, and then when I did the analysis, I realized that from no angle was I looking like somebody starving for food or somebody <laughs> who was uneducated because it's written all over our face that, uh, you know, you're Tambram idiot, you're educated. So, <laughs> and then, and on top of that, I wasn't looking like an athlete at all in that film. <laughs> so, I suddenly realized, this is the, you know, that I should never become what I've become, which are the term that I started to use a lot now, which is called in Hindi, uh, data ke tattu, which means <laughs> idiots who do not know how to interpret the data. <laughs> Everybody has data. Yeah. The, your interpretation and the inferences of those interpretations will determine how successful you are. So while all they were telling me was true, what I had to do was not that. I had to interpret the data def uh, separately and make my own kind of BC center film. So that, that, that film taught me uh, tremendously uh, with a big slap on my face what I needed to do next. So what we'll do is Maddie will get up, stand up here so they can clear this and set up for music. And I have a couple more questions for you. Okay. Now we are moving into the technology side, right? I mean, we've talked about your actor, etc. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs are here and uh, every movie is an entrepreneurial journey, right? So if an entrepreneur asks you, give me an advice, what advice would you have? for him because you've been an entrepreneur many times. Each time when you do a movie, you have no idea I, what it would happen. Lovely way to look at it. One of the things that I saw when I went to Kerala um, almost eight years ago is there was an elephant that was tied outside the temple. And um, on the back leg of that elephant was a rope, a silver rope that was tied, but it wasn't anchored to anything. The elephant stood there for the whole day and it did what it was bid to do. So I asked this man, I said, why have you tied a rope around the leg? But it's not anchored. It's not like the elephant is going to run away. He said, forget about running away. It won't even move. The elephant is going to be there. And I said, how did that happen? So what they do is they take a young elephant, which is three, four months old. They tie a twine around its leg, the same bright uh, 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 rope. And they tie it to a small sapling, literally. The small baby elephant tries many times to break it and go away and be with its mother, but it can't. And um, eventually... It is, it is ingrained in its mind that this string means that I can't move from here. Even though as it grows up, it's just a small tug and the tree would fall. This elephant that can lift a tree that is anchored to is actually anchored by an invisible string on its leg. Ma'am, I can't tell you how many of those invisible ropes we try around our brains because of our conditioning and the way that we are brought up in our, in our uh, society and in our um, uh, cultures. That Chain might not necessarily be a bad thing. Yeah. It might be able to anchor you, to help you settle down in what I call the, the end game of your life, when you want to know who you are, what culture matters to you, what kind of people you want to retire by, and what sort of a society you want to build around yourself when you, when you hang up your boots. But that change should not come into place when it comes into innovation yes. and, to, and to reach the kind of goals that you didn't even imagine existing. Yes. So as far as the entrepreneurs are concerned, I'm going to tell you, I mean, I had a... I had a my phone here, which apparently has disappeared. <laughs> it's been copied and uh, sent off. To I'm <laughs> sure. But, uh, you know, it's a, very, it's a very effective sort of a tune. I have to play this for you if I can. Yeah. That's yeah. just one tune. Anybody? Where is that from? Exactly. What? Titanic. It's one flute. <laughs> One flute yeah. made of an easily accessible material, which is wood. It's a little bit of air and an eternal tune pops out. That tune could have been made by somebody in the film industry in Chennai or in Bombay, but somebody who is an expert as a music director of Titanic comes out of that one tune but, in a yeah. flute mm -hmm. that makes it so impressive that after 15 years of the film's release, just one line is enough for you to recall. For a young kid to for recall. For a young kid to recall. I'm saying as far as India is concerned, we have all the air, we have all the wood, we have all the flutes, 
all you need as entrepreneurs is to find that tune. We have the electricity, we have the know-how in terms of, um, is, you know, the most brilliant software engineers in the world. All you need to do is to put together and stop being followers of the West to help us define our horizon, redefine your own horizons. I think if, you, uh, if you're brave enough to dream of the problems that are going to ha happen in the future and attack them even before they happen, I think the West will look a lot more towards India and our culture for solutions than we look to them. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you.